So to start off, to, this is the API Securities for Enterprises session. Um, we have Janine Ju from R3, Head of Global Developer Relations. We also have uh, Bernard, uh, part of my, sorry if I pronounced it, Hargrin Digi. Did I get that right? Hargrin, CTO from Ping Identity. Uh, Ping Identity, we work a lot of, we have a lot of projects with Ping Identity, we're big fans. Um, and we also have, sorry if I butchered, Isabel Mani. Yes. Perfect. Co-founder and field CTO from 42 Crunch. Okay, I'll let you guys uh, get started and I'll meet myself. Perfect. Thanks, Google. Thanks so much, Fu. Thank you. Thank you so much for coordinating this. So let's get to, I was planning on doing all the inter introductions, but I guess I don't have to. Uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah, we're really excited about this chat about API security for enterprises. Uh, Bernard and Isabel are uh, leaders in, in this industry, and I'm just really excited to really be part of this discussion and also um, be able to you know, take some uh, key takeaways from this, as well as a plan for all enterprise organizations to uh, protect themselves and make sure their platform, their API, or their overall architecture is secure. So just some interesting uh, statistics, and I have to give uh, Postman all the credit because they found it as I was Googling away. But Gartner predicts that by 2022, API security will be the topmost cause of concern for enterprises working with web applications. And there was also reference to the Equifax data breach in 2017, and that led to 150 million user records. Uh, and that was a result of the API vulnerability. So why don't we first start off our discussion with, you know, what is, you know, overall, what is API security and what that means to an organization? Go ahead, Bernard. I, I can go, you know, um... Janine, um, yeah, it's interesting to see the prediction that Dr. Gardner made about a year ago, um, and, it, and it's even more interesting when you when you have conversation with uh, chief security officers in general, right? Uh, Europe, US, Asia. The fact is that enterprise security has not caught up with APIs. It is still for all of them a blind spot, and the fact that APIs are you know being exposed at exponential rates. Uh, has led to a new generation of threats. So it's still maturing, it's still not visible. And as we know, the majority of the big breaches, right, are actually not visible to most organizations. They mostly were made visible by the hackers or maybe the ethical hackers, right, like as it, as it was for Starbucks. But even if you look at Capital One, that, that big breach, right, that happened, it was a hacker that actually was responsible for revealing the breach because at the bank, they didn't see any sign. And it was the same for most banks and insurance companies and so forth. So the fact they are still invisible uh, or not detectable by most organizations make it that API security is not always top of mind for most organizations. And the Garner prediction last year didn't really change much how people look at it, yet the attack surface keep expanding. And so in, a, in an open and connected world, right, um, you cannot overlook API security. And I'm gonna let Isabel comment because API security is also not just about detecting a breach. It's about understanding the behaviors of your APIs because you could have accidental, um, let's call it bugs inside the API or deployment that leads to data leaks and as a big mishap enough to do brand damage and, and economic losses for the for the enterprise. So I think what we, we what I was planning to actually tack on today is there's, there's the hacking and there's this behavior of the API in production that people need to track as well. But Isabel, maybe I'll let you I pass the baton to you. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, um, maybe I want to also take a, a step back uh, based on, on, you know, a, a bit of 42 Crunch history because we're a younger company than, than, than Ping, uh, about three, four years old. When we started three, four years ago, um, we used to have to convince people, you know, there is this thing, you're opening those APIs all over the place. This is creating new problems um, at many different levels. 
and and it's only like probably a year year and a half ago that people came to the realization oh yeah right um we really have a problem here we have let our development teams create all those apis uh, and i have one CISO one day that told me this looks like this is going up like mushrooms all over my data center right uh, because it's very easy to create an api today let's face it uh, you're a developer you go to the internet you look a tutorial uh on any language or framework you want and in in a matter of minutes even you can have something that you can be calling an api right and 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 very often uh, unfortunately um protecting those apis becomes like an afterthought something we say, okay first we'll make sure the API works and functionally does what we want, what business has been asking for. And then, you know, we'll see uh, later uh, what we do about security. We'll have to test it or we'll pass it over the fence to the security people and then find all the problems. And, 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 and unfortunately, the scale at which APIs are written today does not allow for this anymore, right? And, and it's, uh, we'll talk more about this, but it is, um, one of the core problems that we see at our customers today is this scale. Is so how do I deal with the scale at which my development teams are creating APIs, the scale at which their rhythm at which APIs are being changed as well. Because one of the things we have been doing is we've given the developers the means to be extremely agile in automating, deploying their code and testing it and redeploying it. And all of that is like one click of a button and some magic happens and they have a new version popping up. And I have customers doing this multiple times every day, right? If you do this multiple times every day, how are you ensuring that this thing you just deployed and it's not the same one as three hours ago is still as secure as it was three hours ago, right? So, so we have a lot of things to worry about, I think, uh, in terms of APIs because of the context in which we are. And, and, and the last one I just wanted to make, just kind of open the discussion on this as well, is um, there's a lot of moving things in, in securing APIs. There's about, there is the infrastructure that you have to secure. There's like many people using containers today. How do I secure containers? How do I make sure I don't embark in my application vulnerabilities that, have, that are coming from outside? Uh, through libraries or through my operating system that's embedded in that container on top of how do I make sure my developers don't write code that has problems, right? So there's this different layer that people really need to look at here and many choices people have to make. It's a complex topic, right? Which also explains why there are so many problems and why Gartner made, I think, that that prediction, right? You, you know, I, I, Janine, I'm going to tag on, on that one because uh, I, I totally agree with you, Isabel. Uh, there, are, there are layers that you need to apply um, uh, all, all, all during the development cycle of the API and then once you're in production. And then I wouldn't, we're going to tackle those layers in a moment, I know. But people need to think about it this way. There are proper techniques for development and then there are proper things you need to do post-deployment post-exposure. When you talk to uh, chief security officers in general, and then, and that's really exactly what you said, um, Isabel, the first thing they'll tell you when you ask them, API, security, what is your concern? The first answer is, we're really not sure that we know about all the APIs. So the first thing they want is an automated API discovery with associated resources, because they are not sure, as Isabel said, that something didn't pop up last night that they didn't know about, right? If they cannot see it, they cannot protect it, right? That's that's a mindset. The second one is, if you really think about it, right? Tracking API traffic used to be simple when you had a gateway, a silo, right? I have a gateway, I'm good. Now you have clusters of gateways, sometimes for more than one vendor. And sometimes you have AWS API, Azure APIs. And now CISOs will tell you, we cannot track all the traffic anymore. It's all siloed. So how can I get a single pane of glass to yeah. seal the traffic? Mm -hmm. So it's back to, before you can even secure post-deployment, you've got to see what's going on, where are the APIs and where are they. But the fundamental, the, the, I would say the, 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 the foundation of a proper API security is authentication and authorization. 
It is very sad to see today that most public APIs are still not being properly authenticated or not authenticated at all. Uh, the, parlor, the parlor bridge, uh, those APIs had no authentication. And so a lot of those APIs that are exposed to the public have no authentication. Many that are exposed externally have bad authentication system. And many internal APIs have no authentication at all or no proper security because they are internal. And so, you know, we're going to talk about those layers, but one of the fundamental, obviously, um, keystone of security, treat all your APIs as external, as if they were accessible by bad people. And then you sync through it, put authentication and authorization on every one of them, have proper tokens, right? Now, we see it doesn't stop hackers because most breaches happen with valid credentials. Mm. Uh, they use valid tokens, they, they, they have an account, and that's what makes it so difficult for IT security teams to detect a breach. This guy had an account, he signed up to the bank, he went there, opened an account, got access to the app, and then went in and reversed it, reverse engineered it. So we'll talk more about that, but I don't want to monopolize the discussion right now. But um, yeah, I know we're going to touch about those layers, but authentication, authorization is the keystone to proper API security, even for those public APIs. So, Bernard, I have a question for you. You mentioned that if they cannot see it, I love how you say that, if they cannot see it, they cannot protect it. But do you think that's the mindset of all developers, enterprise organizations, or is it a matter of, oh, that's not going to happen to me. I really have nothing to worry about. I, I, what, do you, what are you seeing? Out there? It, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's both, actually, Janine, because uh, the... The, the developers are rewarded for the speed at which they get an API out there, right? So, so there is some organization have proper DevSec uh, capabilities. They will scan the code. They will use tools like 42 Crunch to try to figure out whether or not they're doing the proper thing. But in general, they do not test the APIs for vulnerabilities. They do not test them with a, with a, with a hacker mindset, for example. They don't automate the testing either. And automation is key in all of this. So the first thing is get it out as fast as possible. And then sometimes they go back, once it's in production, and try to see if there are certain things that they forgot. But it's mostly limited because API developers are not paid to properly secure them. The reward system is not there. They're paid to get it out as fast as possible. And if, that leaves a massive blind spot for the security team later. So that's why sometimes the big question is, does API security belong to the developer side or does it belong to the security team, right? Who owns API security? At the end of the day, it's both, right? But that's not always uh, put in place today in most organizations. Hmm. And, and, and on, on, on your point, on, on it is true, I think that we're seeing that as well, that developers are really rewarded to take care of security as early as possible, which we all know, you know, like any bug, right? A, a vulnerability in your code is nothing more than a bug which is related to security, right? Um, and and Really, the, the, the main issue as well, I think, is security tools have been traditionally being built for security people, right? And, and one of the things that you really cannot do and will not work is putting in the hands of developers tools that were built for security people. That doesn't work, right? They've not been made for developers. So there's also this problem that really the developers are not, are not equipped either to uh, take care of security as early as possible in the life cycle, which is really where we could catch a lot of those problems. So we have to so shift. Uh, I usually make this parallel with, with the ops world and how you know before we had the developers, we had the operation guys, and if you were a developer and you needed a machine, you would go and open a ticket and somebody in operations will create a machine for you and put it everything that you needed and that was their world and this was your world, right? And and this is blurring very much, you know, in the, you know, it's, if you take something like Kubernetes, anyone that can write YAML and understands a bit how those applications work can now deploy an application, make it scale with no need to get the help uh, from the, the ops people. They need probably there's some control at ops level of what they can do, 
but they're self-sufficient in doing that. And I think we need to get to the same point for security in, in the end. We need to get to a point where security becomes a commodity, which is easy for developers to use. And then if we do that, then that problem probably won't go away at 100%, but it would help mitigate the problem uh, of being only focused on business delivery to say, okay, I am still focused on business delivery. At the end, this is what I have to do. I need an application that works for the business, right? But I can do that without mitigating on security, right? Because I have the right tools in place to help me do that, right? Um, so, so yeah, it's 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 an important aspect, I think, of, of the problem that we have that we have today. So you are so all saying that developers should be responsible uh, for uh, securing the APIs. So as opposed to like in an enterprise, in a startup organization, unfortunately, everybody has to play the same role. But mm -hmm. in enterprise, what does that structure look like? Yeah, I, I think ultimately there are two. two um, one can make the case for for uh, two two things to happen. One is development teams need to be more aware and better understand how to properly design an API. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that the OAPs, you know, top 10 API vulnerability or risk uh, are a good guidance, good guiding principle to start with. Uh, if you, I mean, the latest parlor bridge that we all so happened right a couple of weeks ago that massive data scraping um the, the all the fundamentals were ignored right no authentication uh, all of the accounts were you know uh, serialized so easy to data data scrape everything very quickly an excessive amount of data being exposed because the video was maintaining all the data the metadata on location and so forth so at the end those are there are guiding principles that you have to follow and then use tools to scan your code for the, the crazy SQL injection and other cross-site scripting thing that people still leave in their code. Even so we have so much, so many tools to let you know that you still have bad code. So it's start there. So first, good dev, right? Good dev, good, you know, good design principle. And two, post-deployment, it's impossible to fully test an API. So you're gonna end up with states that leave you in trouble. And that's what the hackers are looking for. So post deployment, uh, you need to layer an additional set of tools to really do these things like uh, automatically discover all the APIs so I know about them and, and give me the traffic and then tell me what's abnormal with that traffic, right? So post deployment, I would say that belongs to the security team. Pre-deployment development that belong to the dev, DevOps team and the API development team. But post-deployment, right, one of the key things, right, if you want to address the risk posed by APIs, you have to be able to recognize abnormal behaviors. And abnormal behaviors will catch crazy things. Uh, and I'll give you an example, right? A um, couple of years ago, there was this company called Location Smart. They will give you the location of your phone by just, you know, uh, linking to their URL. And they will work with T-Mobile, Verizon, at and and everybody else, right? A hacker found out that by switching the payload type from JSON to XML, the security that was really an authentication for consent was bypassed. And they had access to the location of every phone by just putting the phone number in. So that API was quickly shut down, by the way, by at and T-Mobile, Verizon, and so forth. But give you an idea, hackers are looking for a state in the API, a vulnerability, that will give them access to typically data accounts and so forth. And that's that's really the hunt, right, for hackers. I have to find that. A many examples, but I don't want to monopolize, but the, the Starbucks bridge um, was really about the same thing. Starbucks bridge and open, hey, I'm a Starbucks customer, I have access to a Starbucks app, I go in, I find an internal API, I found a way to bypass the, the typical web application firewall rule base, and I get to the account information for 100 million users, right? So the typical mistakes there, API considered internal, hacker having the application is a valid user, it connects, 
he reverse engineer the API to get access to the data. It's a typical breach. A parlor, you mentioned? Uh, maybe Isabel, do you want to talk about parlor? If you want, I don't want to monopolize the whole uh, discussion there. So maybe yeah, Isabel, about yeah, I, I will. Um, so that um, it, it, because for me, it's it's like the 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 highlight of an example of what you really shouldn't do um, <laughs> in the. Um, what what happened there? So I just track back on 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 the OWASP top ten that that Bernard talked about. I think everyone here listening probably knows about the OWASP top ten. It's been around for 15, 17 years now, and and you know all those best practices around how to make sure you don't leave any vulnerabilities in your code. And we know about this. It's very well documented, and still we're uh, practicing the same mistakes, uh, but quite recently, about a year and a half ago, the, uh, an API security, an API specific OWAS top 10 um, came to light. And, and the, one of the core reason of this is um, traditionally in web applications, what we've been doing is looking for bad stuff, right? So a web application firewall, for example, would look at the traffic, not really knowing what it will actually receive because we had no way to describe what the traffic really would be. So instead we would describe, hey, there's this thing in here I have received, I really don't like it. This looks very much like an injection, so it looks very much like whatever type of signature of something that could be potentially harmful. Right? So we've taken a a, a negative security model where we have to write all those rules to describe all the things that we don't want. Right. So um now if you look at APIs, what does an API do? An API, you ask it for something and it returns some data. So it's really all about, you know, I give you some data, you do something with it, uh, ask you for data, you return me data. So it's all about exposing data. And if you look at the OWASP top 10, you will see that the first six are all about, most of them are about data manipulation, right? So injecting extra data, evading data or exceptions, right? And every API is different, right? So there's a question here in, in, in the chat about, is it a good thing to describe properly what APIs do? And this is the core of what I do, <laughs> I take that question, because one of the key things that we can do with APIs, and you're here in, in, in a Postman conference, so you know about collections and describing APIs and testing them and doing mockups, et cetera, most likely by importing into Postman something like Swagger Open API, which allows you to describe, hey, this is what my API does in the rest world, right? So you, you import that and you have now a description that says, hey, this is my API, that's what it does, this is the data it transports inbound, outbound. So now we have a description, hey, this is my API, it does anything else, I don't know what it is, I don't wanna take it in, right? So my first thing is, okay, as a basics, really, and we, we go back to OWASP and origins, you don't want to trust anything, anything that comes your way in terms of data. You want to validate all of that. We've been saying this for 20 years in AppSec. It is really, really important, right? And you want to do that for any type of API. I'm back to something that Bernard said at the beginning. Um, don't make exceptions, right? Treat your APIs as if they were all external and used by external people. The threat will be different in terms of level. The risk is, diff is different. But if you start saying, oh, yeah, this is all internal, and I'll give you another example, and then I'll talk about Parler. Um, I have this, this customer I talked to a few weeks ago who told me, we found this problem that somebody um, in the company, right, was evading data from the company through the authorization header, right? So when you do authentication, you pass in the authorization header some token and everything. So this guy was doing the reverse. He was actually putting the tokens in the authorization header on the outbound, and therefore getting the response will get you all the tokens, which as Bernard also said before, once I have the tokens, then I can play and do further things, right? Um, so that was an internal threat. And the reason this guy was able to do that is, is because, you know, the, there was nothing validating what are we answering, right? Which data do we return back in our APIs? Why do we have an authorization header in our responses? That's not normal. Somebody should have caught this. 
right? But they didn't. Um, so this OWASP top 10, it has a list of key things, right? And if you look at the threat, so 42 Crunch, if you don't know 42 Crunch, it might be something you know, and I would largely encourage you to uh, register, which is a site called apisecurity.io, right? And we have a, a great newsletter that we curate there on, on, this is not marketing, it's not selling our product. It's really about education, right? And, and we have an education about the OWAS top 10 there. So what happened at Parler and, and many others that we have published in that newsletter is um, we actually have a combination of problems. So our friends at Parler, they have no authentication as Bernard said before, right? And not only do they have no authentication, they have no rate limiting. And on top of that, they have this very, very typical problem, which is number one on the OWASP top 10 list, which is called BOLA, broken object level access. You may have heard about this as IDOR, which was like indirect uh, references, right? And basically the idea is, if I give you an API that says, you know, get account, and I put an account number, and the account number is one, two, three, and I'm Isabel, right? And I'm the owner of account one, two, three, that's all fine. But if I start enumerating one, two, four, one, two, five, one, two, six, but one, two, four, one, two, five, one, two, six are not my accounts, that should be rejected, right? And many, many APIs lack the authorization validation that actually I, Isabel, I'm also the owner of one, two, four, one, two, five, and one, two, six, and not only of one, two, three. So if you combine the fact that I can enumerate one, two, three, one, two, four, all the way to millions, plus there is no rate limiting, so I can do this as fast as I can, <laughs> and there is no authentication, right? Then you get a bomb on your, <laughs> on your hands. And the last point of all of this, which makes it even all worse, is there was no monitoring, which basically means all of this happens unseen. There is no big red thing popping up somewhere in a data center. So you can do this as much as you want and get, what was it, 70 terabytes of data, Bernard? Yeah. Something like that, yeah. Is that that's right. uh, without getting noticed, right? No, so, right? So what's really critical in this OWAS top 10 is you know, most of the big attacks, it's a combination of things, right? Because I didn't have rate limiting, plus I don't have authentication, plus I don't have monitoring. Uh, if you have a problem with IDOR, but you have a rate limiting of three requests per second, right? You will not be able, which is an effective one, you won't be able to go so fast and retrieve data, right? But if you remove rate limiting, it makes it very complicated. Anyway, that's, so, that's really- uh, I'm, I'm gonna tag on that one because- yeah, so yeah. All right. OWASP, great foundation, but but not enough. And what you need to consider is we've seen developers leverage or be dependent on the user interface to filter data, right? Mm -hmm. The problem Isabel just mentioned. And the fact is, the first thing a hacker does, right? He might sign up with, with a bank and get a, an account, have the app, or new trans companies. These are all example of real breaches, uh, or take Facebook, Google, you name it, right? And, and then the first thing he does is bypass the UI. Once he bypasses the UI, he starts playing with a, with a request response, plays with method, different payloads, until he gets to a point where he's tried the API in every potential angle and realize, as Isabel was saying, aha, if I put this request specifically after that response, yeah, I'm gonna get the other data behind it. Mm -hmm. So relying on the UI to filter data is a big mistake. The OWASP top 10 um, is the foundation and it's, it's a, an absolute requirement to really pay attention to this, but it won't be enough to protect your data and your API because ultimately what you have to be able to do is be able to observe abnormal behavior. If a, if a hacker bypasses the UI, you start playing on your API by injecting different things, that behavior has to be detected. And by the way, you might do it for multiple machines at the same time using multiple tokens, mm -hmm. right? So there's nothing that prevents him from getting 10 accounts, 10 tokens and going for it. So you, 
basically, at the end of the day, you got to do all the right things from a development point of view, but you got to do a bit more once you're in production to catch this abnormal situation. And to do this, it's really ultimately a new category of tools, right? Uh, such as 42 Crunch or Ping Identity. At Ping, we are known for our identity and access management. We protect probably more IP infrastructure in the world than anyone else from that point of view. Uh, but you got to go beyond that. And so we have a whole bunch of, of uh, solutions that are based on uh, machine learning. Uh, a lot of people call that AI, so AI ML. Uh, to really catch when a partner is misusing an API. And you know, the most famous example I can give you uh, about this was with Cambridge Analytica use a Facebook API to gather all this information, right? That was uh, deemed to be totally wrong and multiple lawsuits uh, were started after. Well, guess what? Cambridge had the right to use the API. That was not the issue. They used it in a way that was not authorized. And so there's security and breaches and hacking, but there's also these things that happen that are brand damaging, that are not unethical uh, hacking or hacking at all, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so, so you gotta really understand that uh, we, we've we seen that the traditional security solutions that are mostly rule-based, uh, I mean, most people think of, of WAF or next-gen WAF, they're mostly rule-based, uh, are not effective against uh, those, those attacks. Uh, hackers are freestyling their attacks. They are not using, they are freestyling, they're, they're playing smart, they're going after it. So you gotta have uh, solutions to really be able to recognize with ML because it's a big data problem at, the, at you know, in, in fact. You gotta be able to recognize those abnormal behaviors. And if you really think about it, right, at the end of the day, there's not much between a hacker and an API at all. The fact is that most attacks are done with valid credentials. So you gotta have authentication and authorization. That's, that's a must. But a hacker will get those credentials. Either they are stolen. Uh, Capital One, the stolen credential were done through cross-site scripting attack on the credential server. Uh, or they're just valid account with valid users. And so valid token makes it really hard to detect misbehavior. So net net is you gotta think pre-production, you got to think post-production. There's a whole new generation of, of tools and capabilities that have emerged. Um, like Isabel, we started this, uh, I started to develop the first uh, API security from that point of view in 2014. So we go way back um, in our ability to do this. But I wanted to bring this up because can't forget that uh, uh, the majority of all breaches happen with valid credentials. Yeah, so maybe we should, you know, so we have like 10 minutes left. I think maybe we should focus on on, on, on recommendations, maybe, uh, Janine? Is that what? Yes, uh, yes. <laughs> I didn't want to yeah. interrupt. Go ahead. Sure. Yeah, so um, for just a key takeaways from the se session, action items, you know, that could potentially also apply to startups as well as our enterprise uh, clients. I think that would be really helpful just to even starting off with the basics as you mentioned before Bernard even if they do have that but then you also um, mentioned as well uh, you need to go beyond um, some other policies in place so would love to just hear what would be the right strategy okay the team yeah. you know who should own what how should developers be educated how to build out the security team all in like three minutes <laughs> Yeah, so let, let, let me make, maybe get start on this because I, I guess I'm, I'm more on um, on that side of the story. Um, so, so indeed, covering the basics is, is really critical here. Um, and and unfortunately, there's still a lot of companies where the basics are not covered. So I can send an injection in the field that's supposed to be a credit card number and it will work because nobody is looking at it and say, is this really a credit card number? And that could be a regular expression behind the scenes or that has been created one way or another. Uh, but it's back to my point, which is making sure that you don't trust um, basically the system. But I think the, the main problem we have today, and then there's somebody here who, who basically is mentioning that as well, is testing, right? So, so the key problem we see at many of our customers for many reasons is we are testing functionality, 
and, and, and usually when we're testing functionality, it's more like the 200 path than the 401 and 403 paths. <laughs> it's like, is it working from a functional point of view, right? Um, and then, you know, how do we test our APIs in, in those edges and those paths we are not the ones that maybe customers are going to take, but definitely the path that the hackers are going to take. Because a hacker doesn't play nice. He doesn't not, he doesn't going to uh, invoke your API with all the right information. On the contrary, what they are looking for is to go and, and really invoke the API in a different way, right? And this is why, you know, at, at least 42 Crunch, we're really on the shift left and DevSecOps and, and basically educate, but also give those tools to the developers. So, so we're, you know, there's one thing we do at 42 Crunch and in general we're pushing is how can we leverage the army of developers that we have? Because in most of the companies we talk to, we have maybe three people in security for 100 developers, right? So writing all those APIs and throwing them over the fence to the poor three guys from security is not going to do it. So, so automation, putting all the right key, you know, validation in place in a repeatable fashion uh, in our development pipeline is really the way, right? So we really have to make sure that we put in there the think, you know, hack yourselves, basically think like a hacker, or find tools that, you know, it's what we, we're we doing is like, I'm not going to test your API or 42 crunch the right way. I'm just going to hammer it with all kind of data it has never seen just to make sure that it reacts the way it should actually react, right? So if you're going API first, API contract first, this is like the right way of driving that automation and first, you know, making sure that whatever you're going to put in production, you know, maybe we missed a couple of things, right? But it's not like, and, and, and as Bernard is saying, then we have to do all this behavioral and everything. Great. But let's first, you know, start with the basics because can, as much as behavioral stuff to be put in place, if your API is full of holes from a VLAN point of view, that's not going to work, right? Either. You're going to leave all those holes open. That's not going to work. Um, so for me, shift left automation, DevSecOps, the same way we have automated operations, we have to automate security. And that's truly what I believe of the, the, the way forward and giving the tools to the developers to actually enable that. Right. Yeah, I, I totally, totally agree, Isabel. And automation is key, right? If you don't automate all this stuff, you cannot keep up. Uh, and then if, if I'm looking at how we have looked at it, we, we really um, today help some of the world largest organization protect their IP infrastructure, both through authentication, proper authentication, uh, and post-authentication. So I look at it like the zero trust model. You have a user that come in, and he authenticated himself, he got authorized to access the system, the service, the API. So he had a token, and now he access the service. The zero trust model calls for now monitoring everything this user does once he's accessing that API. Mm -hmm. And being able to uh, address at any one time when he's doing something that's not right, right, to remove his access. So the zero trust model, and, and, and you know, if you think about API, right, it's, it's truly the no perimeter uh, situation that zero trust uh, mm -hmm. project, right? It's all HTTPS, it's open to the internet. If you think an API is internal only, think twice, because your hacker is not internal only. So you need to think through this, right? So when, when we talk to the CISOs, uh, it's about, and, and we advise them on, on those, proper authentication, post-authentication, monitor all accesses, monitor the activity to sort out what's bad, abnormal, so you could remove access if you need to, and monitor the data flow over the API, right? So that the data that's flying over this API at one time was properly authorized. And it could be for consent. We have the Cures Act that's coming up in the US right now, right, healthcare. Uh, hey, I need to consent to a hospital getting my data from another hospital or from a, a, a provider, uh, insurance provider. So you need to monitor the activity. You need to monitor the payload over the API. 
and either enforce the corporate policy or the consent of the user. So API traffic, right, has to be monitored both from an activity point of view, is it normal, not normal, has to be monitored from a data flow point of view, and then you need the ability to really have that single pane of glass. And one of the things we've done uh, at PIN is link all of the API traffic to the user. So the blind spot is I'm a user and I'm on you know, vendor A gateway. And the same user, I'm on vendor B gateway. Then I'm on AWS or Azure. Most of our customers have multiple data centers. Now, to any uh, API team, it looks like there's one user on this gateway, one user on this gateway, one user on this gateway. It all looks okay and normal. But if you have this ability to stitch all that traffic to that one user. Now you say, okay, this user is on four gateway platform across three data center, is using 10 tokens, 15 IP addresses, what's going on, right? And then you can sort out that there's something not totally uh, okay with what's going on. So what we really recommend is proper authentication, good visibility, try to link all the traffic to the user, not just to a token, uh, track everything so you can report on the traffic and have forensic data later, identify normality and block them if you have to. It's a, it's a really the zero trust model. Thank you. Uh, so we only have a few minutes left and I want to um, just open the chat for any questions that you'd like to ask for speakers. Plus one for zero trust model. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Okay. Zero trust model calls to monitor everything the user does. Okay. Any questions from our audience? We only have three minutes left. So maybe, Jenny, yes. since we don't have any more questions, maybe uh, I want to reinforce what Isabel was saying, right? Don't, don't, if you are there working in a, in a DevOps or API development community, do, do look for help and guidance on how to properly structure the API definition and create the API, and then uh, share this model across your organization, right? Build a team, share the security mindset with everyone. And then once you go out there and you uh, deploy it, look for tools that will help you monitor what's going on out there. Uh, you get, we need boss, uh, ultimately. So you we, cannot... we have a couple, um, we have a couple questions actually, um, in here from the Slido tab. As I've already mentioned, Slido. Um, do you want to, yeah, do you want to read that? Then? Yeah, that's right. Okay, sorry. Okay. I, can, I can take the one there, how to notify the user, the user is sending requests from different IPs. Mm -hmm. You can do it by, by, and the way we, we do it, right, we track the tokens, we're able to obviously look inside the token and we can stitch all the tokens to specific user identification, right? The actual um, uh, authentication that we did for that person and we can then link all the tokens and then all the traffic to that one user. And that's the way to do it ultimately. And I'll take the, the other one, which is about how do you um, help developers guard real to implement proper security? That's really what we do. Um, <laughs> So the way we're, we're doing it at, uh, at 42 Crunch is basically to take the open API swagger as being like, you know, the definition of the API basically, as being the common language across everyone that will have to work with that API, should it be development, security, or even the ops people. And we're delivering tools that allow to, at starting at development time, to analyze that and give them a report of, hey, you know, if we look at your definition here, there's a bunch of things that you have not defined um, that are potentially going to become a problem in terms of your API. And if you want to try that, again, you can go to apisecure.io. There is a free version of that. If you want to test it on your own API and get that report and see what it looks like. And what this allows us to do is to identify very early in the life cycle what those problems can be and then address them, right? And, and uh, you know, thinking about IPs, by the way, IPs are very dangerous. We don't trust any of them. don't trust IPs. IP addresses can be forged, can be faked, can be easily created. I can go with my credit card to Amazon and create 5,000 machine all with a different IP, right? But I'll be the same person. So you have to be very careful when you do rate limiting. Uh, don't use just IP, use tokens, as Bernard was saying. 
um, and something that uniquely identifies um, the, the, the user beyond just the IP address, right? The, the, it's very easy and, and to fake those. So. Yeah. That's right. And don't rely on API keys for security. Mm. A lot. Uh, too many mistakes. <laughs> Let's all there. agree about all of here. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, so uh, maybe my last word on that. At the end, you need to understand the risk associated with each user and the data or the app that is accessing. It comes down to this, right? You, you, it, it, it's, it's fundamental. Mm -hmm. Jane, back to you. Okay. Thank you so much. And also one more thing I, I really appreciated as well is the mind, having the developer, you know, get into the mindset of a hacker. I think that's really important because I know from a former developer myself, having people look at my code, it is quite intimidating sometimes, you know, everybody thinks their code is perfect, but I really think we need to be uh, more open to evaluating uh, the code, testing it, and also, you know, just to protect it from vulnerabilities. So anyway. <laughs> Lou? Okay. Okay, so um, 10.45? <laughs> Sorry. 10.45. Thank you so much. And um, uh, Bernard, Isabel, do you have contact information you'd like to share? Uh, yeah, with in, you? In that indeed. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Yeah. Thanks. This was an amazing Good panel. Time. Yeah. Yeah, and also I want to mention that... Um, yeah, Postman also posted a great article on I and thank you, Boo. I think I think you did that for me. Oh yeah. <laughs> an API security that you should definitely check out. Oh, let me yeah. post it in the chat right now. Yeah, I can't find it. Oh, very good. And and uh, I, I want to put a plug for Isabel uh, Forty Two Crunch uh, newsletter. Mm -hmm. It is a great newsletter. And the ping the ping website has a bunch of blogs also on API security and white papers. So you could come to the ping website for additional information on 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 this as well. Thanks, Bernard. Same to everyone. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. So the next security. Thank you, yeah. Thank you guys. Bye. So the, the next Thank security you. session is on uh, in, in about twelve minutes in this session room. So you can feel free to go visit the expo booth, uh, take a photo booth if you haven't had a chance. Even I uh, just connect with the fellow community or just hang out. But this session will auto close in about two minutes and open up a new one in five minutes. Thanks everyone. You guys are amazing. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the swag. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Stay safe. Okay. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Isabel. Yeah, thanks. Au revoir. Merci. Au revoir. <laughs> Au revoir.